Okay, everybody. So this is Sarah Moore from the Department of Environmental Conservation, and she's here to talk about uh, heating fuel oil tanks and um, something I'm very interested in. So I, just, so I hope that you guys will enjoy the presentation and be sure and ask questions. We want it to be as interactive as possible, okay? And if you have a question, raise your hand and let us know um, so that we can uh, address your question. Sir? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, welcome, and, and thanks for coming in. It's a wet and uh, dreary evening in Juneau. I don't know how your weather is uh, around the state. But um, as Julie said, I, I work for the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation. I'm the state on-scene coordinator, so I'm the, I manage the three oil spill responders that are stationed in southeast Alaska. I'm going to be talking this evening about home heating oil tanks and um, specifically See, I, I hopefully everybody can now see my, my PowerPoint, but specifically this evening talking about maintaining heating oil tanks, removing them, um, and then installing them. So covered most of it, but um, I'm going to do a quick 101 about ADEC, that's the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation, talk about common spill causes and then how to do tank inspections for both above ground heating oil tanks and underground heating oil tanks, and then how to decommission a tank and then replace it with a new tank, um, including a, a focus on areas with, that are prone to floods and earthquakes, and then very briefly what happens if you've had a spill and then uh, questions at the end. DEC has five different divisions. I work in a division of spill prevention and response, and within that we have three programs. The prevention and emergency response program is where I work, and we do immediate responses to fuel spills or hazardous material spills. We're the people who are there after hours and on weekends to deal with the spill right after it occurs. The contaminated sites program works with typically larger spills and spills that we in the Prevention and Emergency Response Program can't clean up because of uh, the size or scope of contamination. Sometimes this is residential properties, but often um, contaminated sites is dealing with old uh, government facilities, airports, landfills, White Owl sites, that kind of stuff. And then the last program is um, industry preparedness, and they deal specifically with uh, gas stations, tank vessels, uh, other large companies that, that carry, store, and transport fuel. The, the mission statement of DEC is to conserve natural resources and protect the health and safety of the people of the state as well as the environment. Uh, that being said, there aren't actually any regulations for how you maintain, install, or close out the use of a residential heating oil tank. Um, so everything I'm talking about this evening is, is my recommendation. <laughs> um, we do have regulatory authority if a spill occurs on residential property, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. We have three response teams. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the head of the Southeast Area Response Team. We also have a Central Alaska Response Team and a Northern Alaska Response Team with a total of eight offices statewide. Seven of them are staffed full-time and we have 33 oil spill responders. So one of the key messages that I want to get across this evening is the fact that preventing a spill is always easier and cheaper than cleaning one up. Uh, this happens to be an above ground tank that I responded to several years ago and, and put the first container I could find underneath the drip to try to contain as much of the fuel before it entered the ground as possible. This is a, a chart of the causes of residential heating oil spills in between 1991 and 2011, and, and they've been kind of combined and simplified for the graph, but the take-home message is that the most common cause of a residential heating oil tank spill is tank failure. The second most common cause is human error or vandalism, followed by line failure and then structural failure. So we're going to talk briefly about those top four causes. Um, tank failure is normally caused by corrosion, which is caused by contact with water. Above ground tanks are susceptible mostly to internal corrosion, which is counterintuitive, but 
Um, your tank can look really good on the outside, but can be con corroding from the inside out. And this is why we recommend that your standard above ground tank only be used for 10 to 15 years. Because even if you, you maintain the outside impeccably, you really don't know what's going on inside. Underground tanks are susceptible to both internal and external corrosion. Um, the internal corrosion on both above and below ground tanks is caused by the small amount of water that is delivered as part of the fuel, as well as the impurities that form a sludge on the bottom of your tank. And then for underground tanks, they are in wet or acidic soils, which can cause corrosion from the outside. Um, to, to improve the chances that your tank will not fail, um, the ideal solution is to keep water inside your tank to a minimum. You can do that by maintaining your fuel filter on your above ground tank or by removing water inside the tank. And with an above ground tank, you can either choose to drain the water from the tank um, or, or treat it with this isopropyl alcohol. For underground tanks, treating it with isopropyl alcohol is by far the easiest. And, and this is uh, sold under the commercial name of heat. Um, and, and you can buy heat or other isopropyl alcohol products uh, designed for diesel fuel. And what it does is the, the alcohol um, essentially mixes with and absorbs the water, allowing your boiler to burn it just fine. And um, you can um, ask your fuel company to check your tank for water the next time they're filling the tank. And we'll, we'll talk about this more later. Um, and then based on whether or not you have water in your tank, you can add um, traditionally, it's about a quart a year of, of this um, alcohol product. The second most common cause for a residential spill is vandalism and human error. Vandalism, um, they're either stealing your fuel or just being generally nasty, and they go for the low-hanging fruit. So they, they cut uh, fuel lines, like the picture in the, in the PowerPoint. Um, or they break fuel filters to, to access your fuel. Um, it's relatively easy to protect the filters and the fuel lines. You can put them inside um, protective secondary like plastic pipes. Um, you can build little sheds around your, your fuel filter. Uh, you can also buy a locking fill cap. Uh, in Southeast, we're seeing more and more people open fill caps and siphon fuel from above ground heating oil tanks. And when the containers they brought are full, they just leave the hose in the ground so that the rest of the tank um, siphons onto the ground. So a, a locking fill cap will prevent that. Um, the, the fill caps thread onto the top of the pipe, and it's important that you seal those threads. Uh, otherwise, despite the fact that you've put a lock on your cap, um, people will just unscrew the locking gas, uh, fuel cap. Uh, human error, it's harder to provide um, uh, a short list of things to prevent human error because human error can be so varied. Um, they, they produce uh, these things called whistling um, vent caps. And let's see, I'm going to try to um, go back. All right, so now I think you can see, see me a little closer. But what this is, is this screws onto the top of your vent filter on the top of your tank. And this uh, metal part is actually a whistle. And so as the fuel level increases and your tank gets full, it closes this gap and it starts whistling. Um, that way, that was interesting. Um, <laughs> that way your fuel provider knows that they're getting to the top of the fuel tank um, because a lot of human error is, is when the fuel is being delivered. Um, Another common human error that we see is people backing up or running into uh, fuel tanks. So placing them in an area that's away from vehicular traffic or snow plows uh, can, can help a lot. Do you want to see if they have any questions? Yeah, does, does anybody have any questions at this point? Like you have to ask them individually. Like oh, OK. So I don't think anybody's lifting at Hollis. No, from Dillingham. No, okay. from Dillingham. Okay. What about Saldovia? I, Saldovia is good. I have one question. Um, okay, go ahead. I just wanted to, I, to uh, make sure I understood you. You said there are no regulations with regard to if you want to put your tank in the ground or above ground. There isn't 
it's only after there is a problem that there someone would become involved. Is did I understand that correct? Lee? That is that is correct. Um, you can still bury a residential heating oil tank in the state of Alaska. Um, I would certainly recommend against it, um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but th there are no regulatory requirements um, from DEC's point of view about how you install a residential tank. There are um, municipalities and cities that have fire codes that relate to where you place your uh, traditionally above ground fuel tank. Okay. Did that? Yep, yep. All right, the last um, cause, common cause of fuel tank uh, spills that I'm going to talk about this evening is uh, line failure. And this house is a, a prime example. They, they are running um, their fuel line from their tank, which is, you know, quite a ways from the edge of their building unsupported over to the wall of their building where it's it's hitting the wall and then running along the wall until they get to their Toya stove. And if you notice the, the icicles and snow that have built up along the roof and, and what happened is the, um, the ice slid off the roof and it hit the fuel filter and fuel line and it cracked the solid line where it's leaving the tank and you can see the stain around the tank where the fuel uh, leaked out onto the ground. And so their, their solution to protect the line in the future was to build a small shed over the top of their fuel line to protect it from the ice and snow from the roof. Um, it's, the line under the roof is still unsupported, uh, so it's not, not the best um, setup, but certainly you're, you're protecting it from, from ice and line failure. Um, Similarly, you don't want an unprotected, unsupported line in an area where kids tend to play um, or there's heavy foot traffic. Copper tubing is surprisingly um, fragile and uh, you, you want to do everything you can to prevent it from getting damaged. Oh, oh, I lied. There's one more common tank uh, failure and that's, that's stand failure. Uh, the tank on the right was supported by the standard metal pipes and the pipes rusted out and shortly after the tank was filled the stand collapsed causing a, a release of uh, 350 gallons of diesel in this backyard and and this showcases the unfortunate reality that more often than not a fuel spill occurs after you filled your tank and so you know here in Juneau we're paying four to five gallons uh, dollars a gallon for for heating oil I know it's considerably more than that in other places of the state, and and it's the added weight of a filled tank, and also the action of filling the tank can stir up the sediment and sludge at the bottom of the tank, which means if you had a small hole from from corrosion, uh, it may have been there for a while, but it isn't it isn't opened until right after you filled your tank. Um, so if you only fill your tank infrequently. Um, right before the fuel company comes is a really good time to go out and have a look at your tank. Uh, the tank on the left is sitting directly on wood, which can be really hard on a tank because, um, at least here in rainforest southeast, the wood is always wet. And so it can lead to um, external corrosion on above ground tank, which as I mentioned earlier, isn't, isn't normally very common. So tank inspections, if you have an above ground tank, um, there are 10 steps that we recommend that you check maybe, maybe once a year on your tank to get an idea of whether or not uh, it's time to replace the tank. The first one is, does your fill pipe have a cover to keep water out and is the area around it stain free? The more water you have in your tank, the more likelihood that you're gonna have a problem with internal corrosion. Uh, this gentleman is using a five-gallon bucket as a um, cap for his fill pipe. Um, ideally, you would have a more traditional cover that uh, screws on and was meant to cover a pipe, but this is better than nothing. Um, let's see, I was going to mention something else, but it eludes me. Uh, the second yes, one to check. Yep. Can I ask one question? This is Holly. Absolutely. I 
I had to leave for just a second, but um, I notice on my screen that you're the only person and your laptop. Um, is there, did everybody else, are they still there? They are, I, I think. Oh, okay. Artem changed the presentation so that we can see her better. Oh, okay, great. Thanks, Christopher. Just checking. Okay. The, the second thing to check is, is your fuel system protected from falling snow, ice, and trees? And this is the, uh, a similar example to the one we, we saw with the fuel line. Uh, the tank is, uh, in this picture, buried under snow that slid off the roof. And again, it damaged that, that solid piece of pipe as it exits the tank and, and caused a spill. The third thing to check is um, if you have a fuel gauge and an overfill alarm, do they work? Um, and, and we mentioned the, the overfill alarm earlier, this whistle, um, but you want to make sure that if they're there and if your fuel company is expecting to get a whistle or is looking at a gauge and relying on it to determine how much fuel to put in your tank, that they're accurate and they're working. Fourth, uh, check your vent pipe to make sure it's clear of debris and insects. This tank was down in Ketchikan, and they were filling the tank, and there was a wasp nest that had plugged the vent pipe, and the pressure built up to the point that it blew the end of the fuel tank off. And so you can see here that it's uh, on the right-hand side, it's completely separated from the tank and caused a, a relatively large and, and, and rapid fuel spill. The fifth one is the tank free of dents and rust, and is it painted to protect it? Even though above ground heating oil tanks typically fail because of internal corrosion, it doesn't mean that the outside of your tank isn't a good indication of whether or not it's time to replace your tank. Um, excess rust um, on the outside probably means you also have corrosion happening on the inside of your tank. One thing that we see a lot is the, the, this, um, this red color, this barn red color that most tanks come painted is actually a primer. It's not designed for long-term use. And ideally, when you get that tank and you have it installed, you would then paint it a color that you find appealing or that matches your house. Um, so check your tank and make sure it's not this red. You just paint it with any kind of paint, or? Yeah, well, I I recommend um, you know spray paints traditionally the easiest, and they make plenty of spray paints that's you know rust resistant, rust oleum type spray paint, and it works really well. Okay. Um, and and again, it's it's easy to think that if you into, install your tank once, you never have to think about it again, and that's certainly not the case. In, in Southeast, it's not uncommon that you have to paint your tank several times in the 10 to 15 years that you have it in service. The sixth one, I think, might be hidden behind the, the picture, but it's uh, talking about the tank stand again, and, and this was a, a relatively large tank that once they filled it was too much for the rotten wood it was, um, that was supporting it. We also talked about this one, one of those common causes, is your fuel line protected from damage? This one happened to be caused there was an above ground tank that had been painted black and a uh, one year old black bear had realized that that tank got nice and warm in the afternoon and he would crawl up on the top of the tank and take a nap. And he would use the fuel filter and fuel line to give him a little leg up to get up there. And uh, eventually, he, he caused a crimp in the line that caused a spill. Is the fuel filter protected from damage and free of excess water? Fuel filters are really important for maintaining the operation of your boiler. It uh, filters out sediment, um, sludge, and water before it goes into your boiler. But um, if it's full of water and then it freezes, it can fracture the fuel filter like the picture we're seeing here. It's not uncommon that the outside of the filter will be made of glass, which is very susceptible to accidental damage. If your fuel filter is glass um, on the outside, I recommend protecting it, excuse me, especially if it's in a high traffic area. The goldenrod filters, which are a relatively common brand, have a wing nut that's on the bottom, and the wing nut opens the bottom of the filter so that you can drain water out of it. But it's also a really easy place for fuel, 
fuel thieves to get to your fuel. And it's also intriguing to young children. Um, and we've had a number of spills caused by people either accidentally or on purpose opening this wing nut. And so if, if the bottom of your fuel filter has a wing nut and you're in an area um, where vandalism is potentially an issue or you have lots of children, I recommend tightening down the, the wing nut and then breaking off the wings. And you can still open it if you need to with a pair of pliers, but it's just a little bit harder for, for fingers to open it. Number nine is, um, are there stains or wet spots, especially on the end of your tank? And this picture shows that the tank is looking in pretty rough condition. There's pretty bad rust right along the bottom rim. But there's also this stain or wet patch as it's going up. And if you were to run your hand across that and then smell it, it's, it's actually diesel. And the diesel is starting to weep out of the tank. And this is an indication that it's in, in such poor condition that it's essentially already leaking, so the, the volume is uh, inconsequential. So if you have wet patches on the end of your tank, um, I would absolutely recommend that in the next uh, six months, year at max, uh, you replace that tank. Sir, how much does a new tank cost? You know, I, I did a lot of research to try to answer that question, and, and unfortunately there's so much variety statewide that it's, it's a hard question to answer. Um, in Juneau, which you know, has the benefit of being a relatively large city and on, uh, you know, in the capital, but we are also not on the road system. Um, you can buy a 275-gallon standard plain Jane fuel tank um, for $400. Um, and you can you can do all the installation yourself. We'll talk about it a little more. And there are other options that I will talk about and recommend that cost slightly more but last a lot longer. Um, but the the last thing to check and, and to ask yourself when you're thinking about your heating oil tank is, um, is it less than 15 years old? And if not, it's another indication that it's time to add it on to your home improvement list for the next uh, year or so. Underground tank inspections um, are a lot more limited, and this is one of the reasons why I recommend against underground tanks. Um, you can track your fuel usage. That takes a fair amount of diligence, and it's a lot harder to do if you're on a keep fill with your fuel provider. You can also test your tank for excess water, and they make a product called Color Cut, and that's uh, both spelled with K's. Um, it's available at pretty much any plumbing and heating company, but you can also ask your fuel provider to test your tank for water. I mentioned that earlier. And it, it starts out a mustard color, and you spread it on the bottom of a, a yardstick and dip it down to the bottom of your tank, and it turns pink, like in the right-hand photo, if it comes into contact with water. And fuel has a certain amount of impurities in it when it's delivered, and so several inches of water isn't a concern. But if you have, um, you know, certainly more than five inches of water, it's, it's possibly an indication that there's a hole in your tank and it's letting groundwater into your tank. And if groundwater is coming in, unfortunately, that often means that uh, fuel is going out. And so, you know, here we had 10 easy items to check your above ground tank to see if it's a problem, whereas um, there's only two easy ones for your underground tank, and one of them is an indication that it's already leaking. So if you uh, are maybe considering after, yep. I'm uh, Joshua Blodger down in Soldovia for Soldovia Fuel, for the fuel mm -hmm. company that runs there, and I'm unfamiliar with the product you mentioned that lets you detect water at the bottom of the tank. Could I get the name of that one more time? Yeah, it's Color Cut. And color and cut are both spelled with K's. Both K's? Both K's. All right. I'll mention this to my boss because I don't think we have this at the store, but we do have plenty of uh, dip rods to check all the tanks. Yeah, it's, it's really convenient. It's um, quite inexpensive, and, and one tube goes a long ways, um, and it, it, it makes a big big difference in having a, a concept of whether or not your underground tank has gone awry. Um, 
So if you've, if you've realized after thinking about the condition of your tank uh, that maybe it's time to decommission it, um, if it's an underground tank, you can choose to either remove it or leave it in place. I suppose you could make that decision for an above ground tank as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's no regulations, so you can do it yourself or you can hire a contractor. Um, either way, but especially if you do it yourself, take lots of pictures. More and more banks are starting to realize that underground fuel tanks are a huge liability and they're starting to require that underground tanks get decommissioned before a loan is provided. And so um, if you are decommissioning a tank yourself, make sure you take lots of pictures, um, specifically of the bottom of the tank once it's cleaned out so that you can prove down the road that you opened it up, you looked at it, and there were no holes in the bottom of the tank. Um, also recommend um, considering taking soil samples from under the tank, and we'll talk about that more later. Um, going back to the bank and the loan issue, because it's starting to be required as home sale, we're seeing an uptick in leaking underground tanks being discovered as people are trying to close on selling their home. And that makes it much more stressful for the homeowner and, and frankly, much more stressful for, for myself and responders as well, because you certainly um, you know, try to do everything you can to get it cleaned up and, and closed soon enough that it doesn't impact sale. But that being said, I, I recommend um, decommissioning your underground tank well before you plan on selling your house so that if you do find um, an unpleasant surprise, it's less stressful than if you're, if you're in the process of selling. Uh, decommissioning a tank, this is a lot of text, but for, for either um, removing or leaving a, an underground tank in place, you want to first off discontinue oil service to the tank, um, consider utilities that are in the area before you start excavating. Either use or remove all the fuel from the tank. And it's important to remember that the fuel line doesn't touch the bottom of the fuel tank. It's normally set several inches off the bottom. The, the idea being that you don't want to suck any water that's in the bottom of your tank or sludge into your boiler. So three to four inches off the bottom for your uh, fuel line. So if you use your fuel tank until your boiler stops working, you're still going to have some liquid to deal with when you, when you open your tank. And then dig down and expose um, the fuel lines and drain and disconnect them. And then expose and cut open the top of the fuel tank and remove any sludge or liquid inside. Um, diesel doesn't pose um, an explosion hazard like gasoline, so every contractor I've ever seen has just taken a saw to the top of the tank and opened it. Um, if you're doing it yourself and you're concerned, um, you can put um, dry ice in the tank and that will displace the oxygen um, as it puts off o CO, um, CO2, now, now I'm questioning my chemistry. Um, but the important thing to remember is once you open the tank, you're going to have to get inside to clean it out. And if you've just put a whole bunch of dry ice in to displace the oxygen, you do not want to be jumping inside this tank anytime soon because there's no oxygen to breathe. Um, for that reason and just the, the concept of being inside a relatively confined space, if you're doing it yourself, um, always have somebody around with you and, and think about the safety um, and the process that you're going through. Um, make sure that you have gloves and um, disposable rain gear and things that you can, you can peel off and throw away. Uh, they also sell um, single-use respirators to protect your lungs in most hardware stores these days. And um, I wear it a lot when I'm at a heating oil tank spill because I'm exposed more than the average person. But they, they come with organic vapor cartridges, and, and that will protect you from the smell of the diesel. Um, going, going back to the list, if you're planning on removing the tank, once you have it opened and more or less clean of liquid and sludge, you can pull it from the ground using an excavator. And if you find any contamination or holes in your tank, you need to report it to ADEC. If you're leaving the tank in place, you want to make sure that the fill and the vent pipes have been cut off. Uh, we've had 
incredibly frustrating and depressing stories of fuel companies accidentally filling uh, tanks that no longer exist, and so they, they're just pumping diesel into the ground. Um, we recommend that you cut a hole in the bottom of the tank, and you can check under the tank for contamination. And you can either take a soil sample at this point and, and send it to a lab for an actual number result, or you can do something that's called a warm water sheen test. And it's, it's essentially a presence absence test. And you take a handful of soil from under your tank and you put it in a Ziploc bag, and then you cover the soil with warm water. And if the soil puts off the odor of petroleum or there's a sheen on the water, it's an indication that the contamination is present. Um, and again, if you find contamination or holes, you need to report it to ADEC. And then the last step for um, leaving a tank in the ground is to fill it with um, inert material like sand or gravel. It's important that you go through this process, and again, it's a recommendation, but in my, in my view, it's important that you go through this process because you don't want a large void in your yard. Eventually, the tank will fail and collapse and you know, potentially be harmful to a person standing on top of it at the time. If you leave a void in your yard, it can also, um, the water table can force the tank out of the ground over time. And it also prevents the, you know, the accident of the tank being filled when it's no longer in use. Um, you've guaranteed the fact that there isn't any residual oil in the tank that's going to cause a contamination later. Uh, we had a tank that it was no longer in use and they had used the fuel until their boiler stopped and they had cut off the fill and the vent pipes but hadn't actually cleaned out the tank. Um, and so over a multitude of years, the tank filled up with water, and then eventually the oil that was in the bottom of the tank was forced out of the fill in the vent pipe and into their yard. So, you know, going through the process and doing the most you can to clean it out as you're decommissioning it um, will be a good step in the right direction for, for down the road. There are um, two different tank types uh, at the most generic level. Um, now that you've decommissioned your tank, you need a new one. Um, there are above ground tanks and underground tanks. Above ground tanks, you can do this 10 step process and visually inspect them for signs of failure. You can also smell, see, and hear failure. Um, you are much more likely to notice that something has gone wrong with an above ground tank and stop it before you've lost your entire tank than you are with undergrounds. Um, underground tanks, um, are less susceptible to fuel theft and vandalism, but they can leak for years without the homeowner being aware of it. Um, by far the most complex and expensive cleanups that I've done have been for underground tanks. And, and that, that is why I simply cannot recommend that people use them unless you have a very, very compelling reason. Um, more detailed descriptions about different tank types that are available. The, the plain Jane version that almost everybody has is a single walled steel tank. They're available for both above ground and below ground. They're susceptible to both internal and external corrosion. And traditionally they come with a one year manufacturing defect warranty only. Um, now more and more we're starting to see fuel companies around the state offer different technologies for heating oil tank types. Um, we're starting to see coated tanks, which um, are, you know, and, and I've simplified this because there are a million different tank varieties available. Um, a lot of them are available both as above ground and below ground, um, but these are the ones that I, I know exist and that I've seen sold in the state of Alaska, but it by no means is everything that's available out there. But coated tanks, they're steel tanks coated in plastic. The plastic protects against external corrosion, but remember above ground tanks are predominantly susceptible to intern, interior corrosion. Um, they come with a 20 year warranty for external corrosion failure, but, but typically a one or two year for internal corrosion failure. We're also starting to see double bottom tanks, which are, are really interesting. They're still steel tanks, but they have containment built in along the bottom. And so 
if the interior of the bottom of this tank fails, this interstitial space fills up with fuel and it lifts a float and it sends this little flag up at the top of the tank. And so this is protection against that internal corrosion. And, and when that, that fuel tank fails, you have a warning and it still hasn't touched the ground. Um, these tanks I've seen come with a 10-year warranty for internal corrosion and a 15-year warranty for manufacturing defects. This is one that's, that's new to Juno and that I'm really excited about. It's a double-walled tank and it's galvanized steel on the outside, which is the only tank I've ever seen that isn't um, steel, so uh, a little less susceptible to external corrosion. And then it's a plastic inner tank, so internal corrosion is no longer an issue. Um, it, it also has a visual leak alarm in case something happens to the plastic tank and it comes with a 30-year warranty for internal corrosion or manufacturing defects. Um, in Juno, these are several hundred dollars more than your plain Jane single-walled steel tank. But remember, the, the simple steel tanks come with a one-year warranty. This one comes with a 30-year warranty. Um, we recommend 10 to 15-year life on your standard fuel tank. You know, this one, if it's giving you a 30-year warranty, it's at least double the lifespan. So, um, you know, if you have the funds up front to buy a better tank over the long run, it might not be more expensive. And that is assuming that you replace your single walled tank before you have a spill. Uh, certainly, the cost of this tank is less expensive than having a spill on your property because you're going to have to replace your tank anyway, plus the cost and stress of cleaning up fuel. Um, the last type uh, is a fiberglass tank. Fiberglass is corrosion resistant, so you don't have a problem with that. Uh, they traditionally have a stand that is built into it out of fiberglass, so stand collapse um, and corrosion along that line is less of an issue. Um, you can find it in both double and single wall varieties, and they have um, up to a 25-year warranty. Uh, before I go on, does anybody have any questions? I have a question. I have a question. Oh. Are you um, also going to discuss putting lines, uh, the line from the tank? I'm wondering about can you run those under the ground into your house? Is that a any kind of an issue as opposed to running your line above ground? Yeah, I, I don't have a slide for that, but I can certainly talk about it. Um, Again, you can do you can do either way, um, similar to an above ground tank versus an, an underground tank. If you bury your line and there's a problem with it down the line, down the line <laughs> later, um, it can be a lot harder to realize what's happening. And I, I have some examples which I can show at the end of the presentation on a nifty little camera of fuel lines where the fittings have cracked. And so I certainly recommend um, requesting from the person installing your tank that you do a single line from your tank to your boilers. Um, more often than not, it's the fittings and the connections that fail versus the line itself. Um, if you are going to bury the line, there's um, coated uh, copper tubing that's available that's coated in plastic that gives you that you know, extra sense of security similar to the coated fuel tank. You can also um, just put it through a, a regular plastic pipe in the ground. That protects it from um, contact with soil and soil chemistry, and it also means that if there's a spill, um, it's, it's going to isolate it to the, you know, the end of the pipe versus uh, all the way along the, the section of it. Um, if you install the line above ground, uh, support it unlike the, the picture of that home earlier on with the, the fuel line damaged by snow. Uh, it's pretty common in southeast to see it running along the edge or like along the, the base of the siding of the building and that, that seems to work really well. There's a little lip where the, the siding ends and the uh, cement foundation starts and it, it fits in there really nice. Um, one thing that I had never thought about um, until I saw it happen was uh, a contractor decided to bury the telephone lines 
in the same trench as the fuel lines and electrolysis ate through the fuel lines in six months. Um, so it, they, they don't, you know, copper tubing doesn't mesh well with electrical current. Um, so I, that's kind of the, the highs that I can think of off my top of my head. Does that, does that help answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, once you've picked out your above ground tank, um, we recommend 12-inch steel pipe legs that have threaded floor flanges on the bottom, and then either pouring a, a cement pad or using pier blocks on top of six inches of gravel. And it's amazing how much ground can heave as it freezes and thaws, and so having a good foundation for your tank is really important. Other things to consider about tank installation is to avoid high foot traffic areas or areas around winter plowing or a car parking lot. Um, they should be accessible for the fuel delivery company. And this, this is more of a courtesy than anything else, but these, these deliverers are making a lot of, a lot of trips. Um, they have to go back and forth in between their truck to start and stop the fuel delivery. So it's really ideal if they can see the tank from the truck and the truck from the tank, vice versa. Um, it, it makes it a lot easier on them, and it also reduces the chance of an accidental spill when they're filling your tank. Um, mentioned earlier, continuous fuel lines between the tank and the boiler. Avoiding return lines. Some older systems had two fuel lines. One took fuel from the tank to the boiler, and one took non-burned fuel from the boiler back into the tank. Um, and I, I don't know the, the logic behind it from the boiler's point of view, but for a spill response, if there's a crack or a failure of the return line, it can leak for a long time without anybody realizing it. If there's a leak or a crack in the fuel line going to the boiler, it'll cause your boiler to act up and you'll start, you know, it'll stop, it won't, it won't act reliable and you'll start realizing that you have a problem a lot sooner. So I, I recommend against return lines if you're installing a new system. And also as mentioned earlier, check with local building codes and fire codes about how um, close to the house you can place your fuel tank. The um, double wall tank that I showed earlier that was galvanized steel on the outside and plastic on the inside is actually rated to go inside your garage, um, which most people have plenty of things in their garage already and don't necessarily want a fuel tank there. Um, but it means that uh, it can be a lot closer to your boiler, boiler room. All your lines in your tank is inside, so uh, Weather isn't an issue, vandalism isn't, it, isn't an issue, but not every tank is, is rated that way. Uh, tank placement, uh, I've kind of been harping on about this, but this is a cause we see so, so frequently. Um, don't put your fuel tank under the eaves of your house where the snow and the ice and the rain is gonna fall on it. Um, put it on the other side of your house where um, that isn't gonna be a problem. And then earthquakes, um, there are a number of things you can do to improve the chance that your tank isn't gonna cause a spill during an earthquake. You can use a flexible connection between the fuel tank and the house so that as the tank is shaking, the line and the house can be shaking it independently of each other. Um, make sure you inspect the tank stands annually to check for deterioration. Um, Reduce the possibility of damage by keeping the area around the tank clear of debris or trees or other heavy objects. And then possibly the most important is to strap the tank to the stand so that it doesn't bounce off the stand and, and break. Um, this is an example of a, a tank that um, they had installed a flexible hose um, but they had used a garden hose, and garden hoses are not rated for fuel. So it's a good idea, and they got, you know, nine-tenths of the way there, but make sure you're using products that are designed to uh, be in contact with fuel. This tank, to kind of reiterate some of the other points, 
Um, it's, it's rusty, maybe needs another paint job, another consideration. Um, and the tank stand looks like it's seen better days and that it, it might not be ready to hold that tank up right after it gets, uh, gets filled next time. And then flood areas, um, there's a, a lot of indication that this spring could be a very, very high uh, flood for a lot of people around the state. So some things to think about. Um, your vent pipe should extend above the base flood elevations. The, um, again, the flexible connection between the tank and the fuel line helps as things get jostled along. You also want to anchor the entire system into the ground. And I think there's probably many different ways to do this. Um, they sell um, these uh, long and large rods with a, a screw point at the end at hardware stores for anchoring trailers. And they've been used to great success to anchor fuel tanks to the ground. You also want to inspect the tank annually, even if you have it held to the ground. If the if the wood is rotting out, it will be less helpful. The stand, if it's if it's wood based, should be bolted together. We recommend uh, four by four or six by six pressure treated beams or railroad ties uh, stacked together in a pyramid to hold your tank. Uh, the fill pipe or cap um, should be screw on and it should have a gasket so that if it's underwater it's going to contain all the all the oil. Again, uh, use metal strapping to attach the tank to the stand. So that's installation um, of a tank in flood prone areas. If there's a flood warning in your area, things to check. Um, inspect the stand one last time, make sure everything's all right. Close all the valves from the tank so that if the fuel line does get broken or the tank does get damaged, um, or well, the stand gets damaged, your tank is a contained entity. Uh, plug the vent pipes and make sure your fill pipes are, are closed. Um, there's a lot of different ways to plug the vent pipes. <laughs> One that works in a pinch very well is a tennis ball, um, but you can also get actual, actual closures for your vent pipe. Make sure that your tank has your name and phone number on it so it can be re returned to you if it does uh, float off down the road. Make sure that other oil or gas containers around your property are secured and remove debris from around the tank. Uh, it's amazing how much damage little things can do um, when they're in a flood and pressed up against a building. And then after a flood, you want to make sure that you inspect your tank very well before you reuse the system. You also want to check the lines. And part of that is checking to make sure um, that there isn't an excess amount of water in your fuel tank. So this is another use for the color cut. Um, we haven't been talking about it at all, but if you have propane, you also want to make sure that your propane cylinder or natural gas cylinder gets uh, checked and inspected before you use it. Um, that's something best done by your natural gas provider and you should keep all the valves turned off until it's been inspected. Uh, it's, uh, you don't want anything leaking um, and, and building up an explosive atmosphere. Um, after a flood, check your property for rainbow sheen or pooled fuel. And if you see any of that, you need to report the spill to DEC and also to your fire department or village public safety officer. So last, last slide, um, the, the whole um, point of the presentation was to prevent a spill, but if a spill does happen, um, there are a couple of steps, and, and this could be an entire other 10 minute, 10 hour presentation, but um, if you can stop the source of the spill, you need to report it to DEC. This is where our regulatory authority does occur. Um, we're going to recommend that the first step is to clean up the liquid fuel and then excavate and or treat the contaminated soil as kind of the generic second step. Um, I know we're running short on time, so here's my contact information at the top. The next three numbers are the spill reporting phone numbers for the three main offices in Alaska. 
All of the information that I presented today is available in some form or another on our website, and there's the web address, or um, I successfully found it by Googling DEC home heating oil tanks. But one thing that I, I hope, um, in addition to the importance of preventing a spill, I hope I can get across to you tonight is that um, though DEC is a regulatory agency, um, particularly with homeowners, our job is to be of assistance. And our, we deal with a lot of these spills more than any homeowner ever does. We have equipment that we can lend you. We have expertise that we can lend you. Um, our, our ultimate goal is to make sure that the environment gets cleaned up and that it's safe for you to be in your home. But I, I hope that you won't um, hesitate to contact us um, if you have a question or if you think you've had a fuel spill or if you've had a fuel spill. So I know we're running super short on time, but if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. This is, oh, this is Wanda in Dillingham. And so there's like no way to check your tank to see if the metal is thinning underneath? Um, the short answer is no. Um, <laughs> There, there's technology to do it, but I've never seen it applied to an underground heating oil tank. Um, I've heard people using a pressure test or a suction test on their underground tank, but again, that's really uh, identifying the fact that you already have a hole in your tank, and I've seen that do, um, do damage and actually cause a spill down the road, so um, no. Well, I was thinking of above ground, like, because when you look at it mm. from the outside, you can't tell if it's, like, getting thin. So yeah. I was just wondering. I've never seen anybody do it. Um, part of the problem is, and I actually, um, it, it, did everybody copy down the information? I'm going to change the view so I can show you something. Um, I can put it back on later if, uh, if there's any question. But uh, part of the problem is that this failure is really a very small area. And so it would be incredibly difficult to have a tool with the resolution necessary to um, answer that question. Okay, let's see. Let's see if I can do this. I got, well, I got it just a seems tutorial like, earlier. Well, but. It seems like corrosion would be basically on the very bottom of the tank where you might have water pooling under the oil. Sorry, say that again? It seems like a person wouldn't have any corrosion problem except for the very bottom of the tank where water would be pooling under the fuel oil. Like if you had condensation, water would form, drip down, and be on the bottom of the tank. It seems like that would be the only place it could really corrode. It is just right there along the bottom, yeah. But, you know, that's still several inches. Sorry, I'm trying to troubleshoot and talk at the same time. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm not very good at that. Um, you know, you're still talking, you know, maybe six, eight inches wide by, you know, several feet. You know, it's not an insignificant area where this, uh, this can occur. Uh, all right. Um, are you guys seeing my table? No. No? You need to push the presentation button on the remote. Do you see a presentation button on the remote? I think so. That's the, uh-oh. No. Now, computer. Yeah. Oh, I see somebody. Let's see. Try it again. Okay, now times. try it. Okay. Mm hmm. This is working so well in demo. <laughs> uh, Julie, this is Artem. So, what's going yes. on? She what has, you... She's trying. To, she's trying to use the document uh, camera. She has it hooked up, and now we can see it on our laptop, but not on the larger screen. And okay, so, so be... hit the presentation button one more time. Which is the laptop. Yes. And I see you, I see oh, people. I no, it's me. It's me. Oh, I, she... I have VGA in, not VGA out. Okay, okay now I'll try it. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> oh, there it was. It was there just a minute ago. Okay, there we go. There. Can they see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We can't see it, but you guys can. So you got got my. All right. There we go. So okay, I can see it if I. All right, perfect. There we go. So this 
is part of an above ground tank. It's the primer red. Um, it was only three years old. Did I say, I said above ground tank, right? Okay. Uh, three years old, relatively new, looks, looks pretty good, but there's a teeny tiny hole here. And despite the fact that it looks perfectly round, I promise nobody drilled it. <laughs> um, and if you look on the inside, you can see that right along this weld, there's a fair amount of corrosion. And, and this was a manufacturer's defect, a problem with the, the welding chemistry. But, you know, so here's uh, really a, a pencil sized, a, a pencil lead sized hole in the bottom of a tank. And being able to identify that with something um, I think would be really difficult. Um, I also mentioned earlier about the uh, fuel line, fuel. this is a copper fuel line and a connector, and you can see there's a crack in this connector that caused a spill. Similarly, another fuel line with a different type of connector, and again, another crack. I think there was a question. I think there was two. Did I interrupt somebody with a question? No, I have to go, Sarah, Wanda, and Delane Ham. Just thank you so much for uh, doing this presentation. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Before you go, how many people in Dillingham were attending? Two. Yeah, there were two of us. Okay, thank you. No. Thank you here in no. Hollis. You're welcome. And Doherty, how many people in Hollis were attending? Oh, just myself. Just um, you. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. It was very, very a good presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question in Saldovia again. Okay. Um, you were saying how the DEC is there to help, and for especially residential. I mean, that they're. There is a support or whatever to help get things cleaned up if there's a problem. Um, I suspect that people are reluctant sometimes to say when there's a problem because they think it's either going to cost a fortune or they don't know what to do or that they get fined or what. Uh, I mean, I'm just speculating. Yeah, <laughs> but, no, it, it's it's something. But you know, when you hear DC people tend to get, scary. yeah, it sounds scary, I guess, as a, just a regular folk. Um, so help me feel less scared about that, or could you explain how Yeah, that yeah, works? absolutely. Um, and, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, Artem, it's, um, we're just looking at a picture of Doherty right now. We can't see Sarah anymore in Saldovia. <laughs> uh, just a second, let me fix. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and start answering. Um, DEC does not fine people who've had a residential fuel spill. We have the ability to do fines, but we've never used it for a residential fuel spill. You'd have to be, um, you know, negligent, a company, you know, that's, that's where you use it. So, so uh, the concern about fines, though it's a common concern, really isn't, isn't based in fact. Um, we... Cleaning up a fuel spill does cost money, um, but I think, um, at least in my office, I, I make sure all of my responders uh, talk with the homeowner and kind of get an idea of what their abilities are, both physically and financially. A lot of the process of cleaning up a fuel spill can be done yourself, and we work really hard with homeowners to find a balance in between getting the spill cleaned up but also within their means. Um, and it, it's, I mean, it, it goes back to the idea of preventing a spill before it happens. Uh, certainly that's the better option. Um, but, but I think as a whole, as a regulatory agency, we're, we're very compassionate about the fact that it's, it's an expensive process, it's a stressful process, um, and we do the best we can to um, make it as easy as it can be. Um, the, um, yeah, I, I guess that's that's the best I can do. Um, well, that's helpful because I think <laughs> that's what people would be worried about is what's going to happen to me or what, you know. And then I think that's how things don't get, um, the environment doesn't get cleaned up. 
Yeah, yeah, and then that's my. I think they'd rather. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the the unfortunate thing about that is, um, you know, you may not choose, or the person who's had the spill may choose to not report it because they're concerned, which is understandable. Um, but fuel doesn't stay put, and so if it ends up on your neighbor's property. Um, your neighbor is not going to have any qualms about calling the state and saying, suddenly my house smells like diesel and my ditch is full of it. Um, and, and now you have the situation of, of us being you know, frustrated that we've had to spend time um, sleuthing out the source of a spill. And you have a larger area that's been impacted by the spill than if you had called as soon as you realized there was a problem. Um, so I, I think there, um, there are benefits <laughs> To, to calling us as soon as you know, um, but I, I certainly understand and respect people's concerns about it. So Sarah, I have one question. Is there, there's the home energy program that helps people, gives them money to purchase like a new boiler and then re gives them a rebate. Is there any program for these fuel oil tanks that's similar to that so that someone you may not be able to afford a new oil tank mm -hmm. even though you know you need one. Yeah, um, there is not a program available in the state um, either through the state or, as far as I know, through a private entity. Um, I would like to see one, and I would recommend that if you would like to see one, that you uh, talk to your legislature. Okay. It's it's really hard to get much um, progress in that in that sense, but I'd love to see a program that provided assistance for um, replacing underground tanks with above ground tanks or mm -hmm. you know some, something like that. Sarah, this is Rosanna in Salovia, and I actually had two questions. Um, one, they're both equipment questions, and one is in the earthquake picture, you had, you showed metal straps. When mm -hmm. my contractor came to set up my new tank stand, which is attached to a very old, I'm so scared, even older than 15-year-old tank, so I had big alarm bells going off, um, but <laughs> he didn't use metal, he used a canvas strap. Is that something I should be concerned about? I mean, it's strapped to the stand, but it's canvas, not metal. Um, you know, I. it might be a concern if it's always wet. Um, you know, you might end up having more rust along the canvas strap line than if it was metal. Um, you could also end up with your canvas strap um, starting to rot and break when you need it the most, whereas a, a metal strap wouldn't do that. Um, I would say if, you know, if your tank is, is as old as that, that um, you know, put it on the to-do list that when you replace the tank, you also upgrade the strapping system. Okay. And, and so since it was a hand-me-down, it was a, a, a gift from my neighbor, because getting tanks to Soldovia is no small feat. Um, mm -hmm. It's a much larger than I actually need, the size of it. Is there is that a problem? I mean, I'm sure I get more condensation maybe. For example, it's a 350-gallon it's a tank, and I really, it's probably twice as big as what I need. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, tanks that are, that are not getting filled all the way do have more condensation than full tanks and it can lead to faster corrosion. Um, and so we're seeing that a lot now that fuel prices are so high that people are only putting in 50 gallons at a time in a 300 gallon tank, and we're seeing more spills because of it. Um, even if you keep your 500 gallon tank full, even if you don't need something that large, you also have just a much larger threat if something does happen. Um, if you know if you're only using 200 gallons every six months, why not get a 275? And then if if you have a spill, you've only lost 275 gallons or or less, depending on the how full the tank is, versus 500 gallons. Thank you, Sarah. You bet. It was my pleasure. And uh, you know, you, hopefully you got my phone number down. And uh, feel free to call me if if you go home and you look at your tank and you come up with new questions, or um, you know, give the office that's closest to you a call, and you'll get to talk to one of my coworkers. But 
we, you know, we really are here to help, and we're trying desperately to get the word out about preventing spills. I would love to be out of a job. <laughs> um, so. Thank you so much. All right. Have a wonderful yeah. evening. Nice to see you guys again. Bye, Rosanna. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Dory. Bye.